Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I can say I'm doing a lot better than a lot of these GitLab servers out here. How about that? <laughs> How are you doing over there? Yeah, no, everything's everything's uh not DDoSing other things right now. So I think I'm I'm pretty good as we saw uh in the b- between last episode and now. Um the the title of our first article here is that GitLab servers are being exploited in DDoS attacks in excess of 1 terabit per second. And I thought this was a very interesting way to bring up the difference between an open source software project uh, and the company in charge of hosting that project. Uh, because right here is is a perfect example, right? GitLab. GitLab is both a product in, in the sense that it is a software GitLab that is, you know, the version control system and and the CSCD pipeline and everything around that. Uh, but it's also GitLab.com, which is the company behind that project who runs that project and uh, hosts the various uh, offerings that that they provide. Right. So so anyone can go out there and run their own GitLab server. Uh, but GitLab.com is where they provide hosting for you were you to want to take advantage of that. So we've gone through the have a nebulous pricing scheme but the 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 service there is is available to be taken advantage of Uh, so with that understanding in mind there was a a cve that came out uh, that gitlab patched in their code base in april 2021 Uh, and in the article they go in and describe really what that that attack surface is, but that's not important to the point I'm making here, right? The point I'm making here uh, is found in the third section here where they say about 30,000 GitLab servers remain unpatched. Now, that that instantly conjures up, how can this one company leave so many servers unpatched? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa slow down. <laughs> this is a GitLab.com that's unpatched. These are all the GitLab servers out there that individuals host that remain unpatched. Yeah, I was going to say the CE and at the Community Edition and Enterprise Edition. You had me confused where, we were, where, we, where you were taking me there with that one. And then you clarified it with, no, 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 it's not GitLab.com's instance. It's everyone else's server, basically. Yeah, and, and all these other servers that are out there somewhere on the internet where this, this scan had been run, uh, they are uh, all unpatched. So all those unpatched servers are uh, have not been updated for that push, uh, fix that was pushed out in April, uh, and uh, there's there's other ways to prevent this, of course, and and I think that's the beauty of open source software is like if you're running behind a reverse proxy, just like don't allow right. the uploading of specific files, you know, at, at that that proxy level, um, or patch your server, right? Uh, so and honestly, this is this is what I'm talking about though, in that you know, our compose. The company, not the product, uh, well, Compositional Enterprise, the company, can provide a hosting solution wherein the upgrades are taken care of, right? right. You're not running the server. And, and, and I look at a lot of DigitalOcean droplets, you know, their, their pre-baked application. Linode has the same thing. Uh, AWS, uh, Google Cloud, they all have these services where they're like, hey, we're going to deploy a stack for you. You know, it's a, it's a full, you know, database uh, middleware, you know, front end kind of stack for you on a server. We'll, we'll deploy that one click. Not a problem. There is no mention in there of updates or upgrades or patches or, or anything like that, right? You're, you're kind of stuck with that version and you better know how to take care of it. You better know how to upgrade it or you better be really good at migrating data over to a brand new instance using a redeploy in like a floating IP or some of the other tricks that you can use. But still at, at that point, right, you've gone from, oh, it's a one click app to I have to build up all of this stuff around it. Infrastructure right around it. Yeah. And and that's where I live. Honestly, that is that is where I love to kind of tinker around. Uh, and, and that's, I think, where my strengths lie. So if if yours don't, right, that's where, you know, Compositional Enterprises, the company, can offer R-Compose the product and 
and and do that maintenance, do that those upgrades, do the backups. You know, make sure you have a a, a good defensive security posture um, while you're out on the internet because that's a very scary place to be. I think speaking of scary here, I added this show note in at the last minute here. Google, we we continue to speak on these services being so resilient. We speak on how their uptime is crazy. Well, let me tell you the Google. The Google Cloud um, SLA of their five nines or whatever they whatever their SLA is they provide for their customers, I don't think it's going to be met this year. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, it looked like there was a networking change with some of the load balancers causing a slew of services to go down, and it just goes to show just because they're out there and they're that massive like that, it doesn't mean it does not prevent you from. If you stand your servers up on it, it doesn't prevent you from running into an issue on their end, right? You're kind of at the mercy of them almost. So kind of an interesting one. We'll see what happens. It still looked like as of this evening, uh, I checked this morning and it was offline. Uh, They're having one of their services was just in a critical state. I checked this evening again and it looked like some of those same services were still in a critical state and uh, fewer at like a reduced incident incident status with uh, like some mitigation available but like any uh, i'm sure yeah like any good uh it uh personnel i immediately hopped on reddit to figure out what was going on and i i came across a thread and someone's like well maybe they should change all their branches back f- to master from main which they had um recently renamed i'm like you know what there may be automated tests who knows right that are hard coded with the uh, head branch being being master as it has been for the past you know 20 odd years so uh, based on uh, based on Nothing but sheer conjecture, uh, I would say that. You know, make that change. You know, look at your change management. All right, what was the last thing? What was the last major change that occurred? And and see how that could uh, contribute to the to the issue here. So just just following good IT practices myself. I and I think we'll get into some more composed developments around uh, master here. I don't know if this week, if not next episode. So, uh, yeah, I think I think I want to dive into 4.0 next episode because we I, I do also want to speak on the, the technical uh, implementation uh, of the namesake of this podcast. So so dollar bar itself uh, before we get into the actual integration discussion. Uh, but prior to all of that, uh, I did have one more article that I thought was uh, interesting, you know, more, more of the soft skills, you know, as we continue to, to bring more of this to the table, to keep this, keep this as a, in the front of our minds, you know, as, as we, the, the more techie people are, are bound to drift off into the, the more interesting aspects, the, you know, the, the technical aspects of this, uh, there was an article recently published by Laura Hogan. Uh, discussing about how you can be directive without being a jerk. Uh, if you remember back to our, oh man, what, what episode was it? We were talking about the different types of managers and how in an emergency situation, yeah. you know, you would want to be someone who could be decisive, right? And make decisions and, and provide a, uh, a, a, a vision and, and goals and, and that type of leadership for a team, right? Uh, and, and all the downsides that came along with that, you know, it only worked for a very short period of time in a specific circumstance, right? But, but given those, how do you do it well? Uh, and and I thought this this kind of touched on a couple of points uh, that we had discussed previously. So I, w- I want to make sure that we're looping back and keeping those fresh in our minds, uh, as well as uh, some really good framing here. So I'm going to read a couple excerpts from the article and we'll discuss here. Uh, so to start off, the first quote I pulled was, when your team faces any hurdle or stuck moment, you'll need to decide how to jump in. You might choose to adopt an empowering approach, viewing your role more as a facilitator and support structure as the team plots the path forward. But there will still likely be moments where you need to be directive, making decisions and tackling aspects of the work yourself. Don't worry, we can still approach this in a way that drives buy-in and helps your teammates feel heard and know they have autonomy. 
Now that that last word is a big red flag to me. Not red flag, but you know, it's a it's a it's a keyword for me, right? Indicator, I see, right? I see a con- uh, autonomy, and I think, okay, this is this is a good point of view to approach the situation uh, with because we, we, we want to make sure that people feel heard and that they have buy-in. That's the only way you're going to get a team moving in the same direction is if at least they have some kind of consideration. I know we talked about in the Scrum Band episode, right? You need to have the stakeholders uh, feel that they were at least heard, you know, if if not, you know, an integral part of the process itself as it comes to to fruition, right? Uh, and and that kind of drives that autonomy, knowing that they've been involved in the decision making. So even when you're being directive, you still have to take these things into consideration, right? We we can still, she says, approach this in a way that drives buy in and helps your teammates feel heard and know they have autonomy, right? Uh, and then what what does this mean? So like, what are we doing at this point in time? So she says, when we as managers are being directive on a project, we're deciding on the who, what, when, and how. And then we're communicating that information to the rest of the team. Now, to me, this feels a lot like scope, right? When we talk about we're scoping a project, right? We're determining the, the why done how, you know, why are we doing this? What does done look like? And how might we start to approach that? Uh, she narrows in on the role of someone, you know, and, and, and namely their role in the product. <clears throat> so, or, or, or project, right? D- depending. So she's talking about if your role is defined uh, with how you're going to do your work, right? You are obliged to follow that uh, in an inflexible type manner, right? You can't iterate over time um, and your role success criteria remains, uh, well, your your role success criteria is simply the how you do it, right? And I think we've, we've broken this up, you know, trying to map her thought process on how we do it, right? We map this out as in, let's define this, the done state, right? What is What is the thing we're trying to get done? You know, what is the outcome? You know, what is, what is the, what does it need to happen in order for this to be considered done? Uh, And then we also had the why at the end, or excuse me, the how we have the how at the end. We say, how can this get done? We define how this can be done. And and I say can be done, right? Because this is something that's going to be flexible. This is something that's going to change over time as we get more into the weeds uh, on a specific task. We're going to, we're going to determine, you know, how how can we best approach this? Is our first approach uh, the best way or, or do we need to iterate over that while still remaining uh, the same when it comes to the, the role success criteria here or like I say, the definition of done? The one thing I really liked from this article on that portion basically is defining – when you define scope, right, you have to define – what your role is in that in the scope of that task essentially you say fine you you get all the key players together and you say all right what's our definition of done this but then i really like she kind of had this little tangent in there uh you might have noticed that i tried to avoid the word accountable when i'm listing responsibilities and she goes on to say i found accountable can mean many different things to many different people uh and then she has in quotes here we'll get fired if this doesn't happen (laughs) It's the communications person or liaison is doing the work directly. So that person's accountable for it. Glad we can do the air quotes now on the podcast. Um, But I really like the prescription that she kind of had, which was the recommendation to describe what you actually mean when you say accountable. Because I know we've said we brought up accountability quite a bit, but it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And that's the one thing I kind of take out of that scope too it's all right you're accountable for this but what does that mean yeah and you're accountable and especially in a larger project too when you're breaking up specific tasks what you're able to do is saying all right well here's here's the done condition for this task You, you don't have to accomplish the entire thing right your role in this big project for right now is this one deliverable just this right just this right you don't have to solve the entire problem like when I was working on 4.0, and of course I'm going to talk on it because why not, right? How could Fresh. I how could I get through this without you know disclosing? But anyways, in in this I I, I ran into an issue with Portal, 
And I was like, here's the question. Do I fix portal? Right. Or do I work around the limitations that's there? Right. Because there's, there's also limitations coming in from other externalities that aren't going to be addressed. Right. So I don't necessarily, it's not blocking to this. It's not going to affect my ability to meet my done condition. Right. Do I address this or not? And if it's not in my done condition, then no, that's outside of my scope. And then that should be for a, a separate task. Right. And that's a right. that's a very concrete way to approach a very difficult, nuanced problem. And I do bring up the fact that it is a larger project because that's that's really what this this post is is written uh, to here. It's 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 a larger projects that aren't a particular task. And and I know we haven't really talked about that because usually our, our, our Q4 meetings, you know, our road road uh, map meetings are are. Uh, just between the two of us and we're deciding on, you know, what, what to prioritize, what, what not to. Uh, and then we have those projects that we review periodically, but usually you and I are focused on specific tasks that need to get implemented. Right. And, and, and tracking those through their life cycle. Uh, what she's talking about here is a, a, a bigger type of project. Right. And, and talking about um, how to get a team through that particular project project right um i i do like here she picks up from where you left off on the discussion about the crocodile brain and and uh kind of your your gut reaction there uh the fight or flight response um and 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 the rest of those you know cliches uh she she talks about it in the terms of amygdala hijacking which i thought was very interesting right where you get that you get that quick reaction to something right you get that you get that uh that muscle memory reaction to something and and how do you start to dissuade that right um and and i think she has three really good points here and 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 these are these are at the level of you know dale carnegie uh if if you want to calm anyone down, just tell them, hey, I totally understand where you're coming from. And if I was in the same position as you, I undoubtedly would be thinking the same thing, right? That immediately disarms anyone. I think these questions are kind of in that vein uh, where she's she's talking about we're, we're, we're not optimizing, you know, for avoiding grumpiness, right? But we do want to understand where people are coming from. And her three questions are these, you know, what feels most important? to you about this that really gets deep into the heart of the matter that bypasses, you know, what's, what's your gut check about this? No. What is, what feels most important to you about this? Really dig deep and, you know, uh, do this, um, you know, and, and, and what is your, what is your gut telling you? Because as your elephant leans, right, you don't want your li- your, your rider. And I'm going to go back to that analogy as your, as your elephant leans, you don't want your rider to, become a PR person, right? You don't want them to to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to make something up as I go along and hopefully it's going to re- reflect reality at some point, right? You got to, you got to take a step, take a breather, right? Take, take five minutes and say, all right, what's, what's going on, right? You obviously feel some sort of way about this. Let's spend time to figure out why you feel that kind of way. Um, and, and another one, a really good leading question that could either lead into, discussion like a larger discussion or a more specific discussion right it could be a lot of surface type issues or it could be one really deep issue um and and that's going to be uncovered by asking what one thing do you wish you could change about this um and and that could lead into you know it, it any kind of tangent but i think that's going to be a tangent that people are going to follow their mind about and they're going to say hey um, let me bring up what's actually on my mind. And, and, and really that's what you're trying to do with all the three of these questions. You're trying to get, you know, people to be upfront and honest and, and, and get a good reading out of them. Um, so if those three questions I think are, are one of my key takeaways and saying that those, those were really well put together. Uh, she says, you know, it goes on, why are we using these questions? She says, by using a coaching type of approach, uh, you're actually operating from the empowerment end of the spectrum, right? Which we know is the long-term success. You know, it's, it's not the short emergency way to, to attack things. If, if you're able to slow down for 20 minutes, and I guarantee you, you, ask, you tell someone, hey, 
I'll get to this in 20 minutes, right? There, there will be the same kind of responses. I will get to this right now. You, you can take 20 minutes. Yeah. You can sit back and take 20 minutes because this is important, right? So uh, operating from the empowerment end of the spectrum is important. Uh, she says, in a lot of directive settings, you will still have an opportunity to leverage empowering skills to help others feel seen and heard and to help them grow. That's why it's important to continue adapting your approach as the context evolves, right? As soon as you know that you can take those 20 minutes that you're not in a a, a every second counts type of situation, as, as soon as you're like... It would be better to have buy-in for the long term over this. You can step back and, and start taking that that empowerment approach. Uh, and she, she even goes on and talking about what she sees as the bigger win. Uh, she says, asking these open questions and reflecting on what you heard them say will make your teammate feel heard and seen, which speaks which speeds up their ability to recover from their amygdala hijack. They can they can recover from thinking from with that crocodile brain and they can start having totally. a real true conversation with you, which is what you need. You need you need people to be open, honest and truthful. And 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 that's the kind of culture you're trying to cultivate with this this approach. I agree. I I like the article. I'll tell you what I took away two. Uh, there were two main points I, t- I, w- I took away from it, specifically myself. Uh, and those two were basically, as you kind of touched on them there, uh, identification, right? And I like how you put it into the word scope. I didn't even think of that. I just said, I just, you know, asked myself the questions. What needs to get done? Who's doing it? Why is it being done? You know, how is it getting done? Fine, right. And then the second part I took away was how is it being communicated? How are you communicating this to either direct reports or to the business or the project? How how are you communicating it to again, essentially all the stakeholders? And those are, I didn't boil it down all the way to the sub levels, but those are the two things that I mainly took away from this article that I really liked. And I thought she did a very, I thought she did a great job writing it. Yeah, it was, it was a, a beast of an article. She, she really covered a, a, a plethora of things here. Uh, so yeah, props, props on, on that article. I'm interested to see if I run across any more of this. Yeah, I did. I thought you linked, uh, one more in there from her. I didn't get a chance to look at that one, but I saw one was linked in the show notes. Oh, that was the, uh, the article that she had written about the classic signs of amygdala hijacking. Uh, so she goes in and says, you know, what, uh, what to do when your employees are in crisis mode. Right. Uh, and, and she says, you know, what does this look like? You know, what what are some red flags when you say, oh, someone is panicking right now? You know, uh, so she says folks in flight or fight mode will commonly display one of these five forms of resistance, uh, questioning or doubting, uh, avoiding, fighting, bonding or escaping. Uh, and then she links to her article on Forbes where she does that write up. And that's definitely one worth checking out. I'm going to have to take a look at it after this uh, episode here. Yeah, but I think we can move on to uh, the one article that you found this week uh, in our community. I'll tell you what, it was a light week this week. Usually I feel like Rundeck is kind of running in sync with a podcast here with a release every uh, podcast episode or at least the day before. No updates from them, so I don't know what's going on. Maybe they're f- coming up with a new name uh, for the next release. <laughs> but um, the one news article we did have was even, in this case, a small one. Uh, WordPress did get up upgraded here to 5.8.2, and nothing major released. It's two bug fixes and a security fix, so nothing major to report on this. It has been updated, but... Uh, it sounds like 5.9 is right around the corner based on what the blog post said. But that is all I have for community updates. I think we should jump right into our developments. I know we have a f- quite a few coming in the in the pipeline right now and uh, kind of what we've already completed here. Yeah, we are we are definitely full steam ahead. Uh, and, and I think that's that momentum is just uh, continuing to carry us forward here. So, so super happy about that uh, to kind of go over what we have. Uh, been doing um, I'm actually going to hit our last one first here which is retiring our Instagram account 
Um, I just don't think that's the right place for us to be right now. And I, I, I think we had that discussion and, and uh, we were in agreement about that. Uh, so we're retiring that. We, uh, we have started um, establishing a presence on uh, LinkedIn. Obviously, we're still on Reddit um, and YouTube as well. So uh, thinking about other sites right now, nothing is confirmed. But there, we're, we're not a content creation, uh, you know shop here despite what it may seem like uh, we actually do put a lot of work into what we do that being said my next item is is about a blog that we're putting out um and and i just i just threw the title here how to pass raw tags to a jekyll post which you've obviously learned how to do given our second post Learned that one the hard way yes <laughs> Yes. Um, so when you had done the the write up about uh, cloud in it, and uh, or or was that no, that was the first one. The you it had... was the first one. It was about developing an on. If you're interested in developing, essentially, I wrote this mm. neat little article on uh, how you can contribute or how if you want to add a service of your own to add it. You know, you can clone down our project and our uh, collection here. Uh, out on GitLab, and you can spin up your own instance, and you can run Ansible against it, and you can spin up whatever services you like with the tasks. Well, I go to write this right up. Sure enough, I merge it into master thinking, yeah, everything's looking great. Did not test it. It being Jek a Jekyll blog, thinking, oh, this is going to work fine. Which uses, against which uses uh, li uh, um, liquid uh templates liquid. yeah 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 jinja yep. jinja liquid templates which ansible also uses jinja templating which means when you're putting in code that has variables in it and jekyll's trying to interpret the post itself as a post and sees a variable that it recognizes it says i'm going to try to interpret that variable yep unfortunately so luckily for us i think jekyll's the last service to be built if I'm understanding that correctly. Uh, so <laughs> luckily all of our systems stayed online. Everything we were able to run a composition, we were able to get a fix in, add in some raw tags basically. So uh, the liquid wasn't parsing it as actual code and we were able to get that fix. With that being said, we do have another post out as well on cloud in it. And if you go and look, I believe I kept in the raw tags. I think it's just going to be something I do now from now on on those code snippets because if I don't do it on some and do it on others, I'm just going to get in the tendency to not do it because I'm not used to it. Um, but we do have another great write-up out on the Compositional Enterprises blog, which we will add a link to in the show notes here. And we will continue to add posts I will say they come out usually the week after the podcast is online. So yep. that's out there. Another resource. Uh, and then the last development here is our our inclusion of, of Dollabar uh, into our services. So this is, this is the latest service. Uh, and this is been recently added uh right now it's sitting as of one week ago uh most of the testing had been done i think about two weeks ago but the the takeaway here is that uh dollar bar uh being an erp which is an enterprise resource platform um has planning planning and a source yeah, yeah and yeah. An enterprise resource planning uh, software has been included here. Uh, and, and this goes actually hand in hand, uh, Jack, with your first write up on the blog, where this is a very, very simple service that got added. Uh, you know, we put in all the necessary variables. It follows kind of the standard template of setting up the database, uh, spinning up the Docker container, uh, you know, creating the bind mount points and establishing the, the administrator. Uh, and 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 then as well setting the nginx config. Uh, so if you're looking for a really good example of what Jack was talking about when when he's like, uh, you know, what does it take to add a service? Uh, this is this is a really prime example of that because it's as straightforward as you can get. Yeah, and with the I might have to 
with 4.0 coming right around the corner here, I know we keep mentioning it. We're not going to talk on it uh, this episode, but the next one, give you something to look forward to here. Uh, we will discuss it. Uh, coming down the pipeline, I'm sure I will have a technical post up on adding a service with our 4.0 release. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's not much different uh, other than it's completely different. So as long as long as you convey that to the audience, we'll be fine. <laughs> so go for it. go for it. <laughs> Speaking of conveying things to the audience, uh, if you wanted to, Jack, uh, we can go ahead and and go over an overview of uh, Dollar Bar. I, I I think you have that queued up for us. I do here. Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, just on the little bit of jumbled confusion there on enterprise resource planning, enterprise resource platform, enterprise resource, whatever. Um, I did want to go into a brief overview on what an ERP actually is and what it does. And I found kind of a great article on Oracle site. I didn't link it in the uh, overview of Dollabar here, um, but... Just to give a, a quick background on what an ERP is, it it's a type of software that organizations use to manage day-to-day -day business activities such as accounting, procurement, project management, risk management and compliance, and supply chain operations. Okay, great, right? That's fine. That's perfect. That You just threw a bunch of words at me that a, a business is supposed to do, and I guess they do all of these things, whatever. Um, if you break it down to a technical level, though, an ERP is basically... A schema right it's a it's and i say this for every web app it's a database but this schema essentially has everything your business would need to function from all of those different aspects i, I mentioned accounting procurement project management risk management compliance you know hr all in one place what do, so now what do you mean of, it it has all of them like it so it can perform say, yeah so say you have so say you have a vendor right sure you have your vendor and you buy a product from them mm -hmm. and say you're their vendor for multiple products. So in your ERP, so if you were to do this traditionally, basically I'm sure you'd have multiple different departments reaching out saying, Hey, we need part X, which is, let's just say a screw or something. And that same company provides, well, I don't want to go too far here. We'll just say a screwdriver. Okay. Well, you have a screw and a screwdriver. Same company provides both. Well, traditionally, maybe if your business isn't operating efficiently as possible you probably have one department reaching out for the screws to the same vendor to a vendor and you probably have a different department reaching out to the same vendor for screwdrivers well maybe you can just package that in and say hey with you know one screwdriver can you ten send us 10 screws and it's a terrible example because you buy a screwdriver basically once and you buy screws all the time but if you were to look at this in an erp sense Essentially, what you can do is instead of having to ask six different teams or one, you know, two different teams, all right, who do we get the screws from? We need screws now. Or, hey, we need a screwdriver. Who do we get that from? You basically can add your vendor in, add the list of products that they have as somewhat of a their inventory or this is what we buy from them. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to track that through the life cycle, if that makes sense. So you're saying that uh, with... With this, I would have, instead of various teams uh, handling stuff in their own way, right, this would take care of both it's of their problems. One loca it's one location, right? It's enterprise resource planning. So it's, right, that's exactly what it is. You have everything in one spot to do everything. And it's a terror. I mean, that's so broad, right? That's yeah. so broad. Yeah, well, and, and but that's, that's why kind I of what, it. Yeah. That's kind of what ERPs are. They do, pro they essentially do processes right mm. they do business they their account they're i would call it mostly financial related business processes now the awesome thing with dollar bar is that it's modular based right mm -hmm. so say you're an organization that only needs, needs to do a handful of things maybe you only maybe you're a freelancer and you only need to provide services to whomever basically what you're going to do is you know if you're ceo and you have a couple developers under you you're going to Go in, you're going to create a couple of your own as as a freelance business owner. You're going to go in. They have a great account management. Mm. So you can go in, you can create who's, 
you know, what's the hierarchy look like? Uh, you can kind of set sick days, paydays, all of that. And then you can set up, um, there are a couple things here you can set up. Uh, so you're not selling a physical product, so you're not going to need, you know, stock management. Mm -hmm. You don't, there's module, there's mo all kinds of modules for that. You're, you're not going to need that. You are going to need, uh, payments management, invoicing, mm -hmm. contracts, mm -hmm. you know, I think you can send out, uh, it, I'm trying to think of the word for it here. Um, proposals. So it, it, all of this is basically in one place. Well, and, um, and not only that, but, you know, down here it, it talks about, you know, mass emailing and, it, you know, employee management, yeah, like right. leave requests. So like I could I could do time yep. tracking in this, too. Yeah. Uh, and then reporting uh, document management. So like this could be, you know, if you really wanted everything in one place. Right. You, you, you might not necessarily if you you're looking it. for like a. a a document storage, you might not need Nextcloud if you already have dollar bar set up because why introduce a different system when this could already do that with another module? And I would I would agree with you, but I would say this is very business oriented, okay. right? Yeah, if you're, sure. If you're, I think I, Nextcloud does I, I didn't have want a you very, to take the jab. I was going to yeah. say I, Nextcloud is its own ecosystem. It is. Uh, for document management, it has all those tools, but this is just kind of a different... Well, and to that point, Nextcloud could be a password manager too, right? If you really, right. really wanted right. it to be. But guess what? You know, what's a tool for the job? Maybe if your entire ecosystem isn't Nextcloud, you're like, you know what? Let's just keep it there. Like, let's just we we could, yeah. We, right. Let's just keep it there. Like, but if you have a couple of systems, you're like, you know what? I need all this complicated sharing and stuff, and I want you know guaranteed zero knowledge proofs, and you know. Bitwarden is absolutely your answer at that point, right? Much like if you've got several different aspects of your business that you kind of want to be interconnected, right? You want to know what employee is reaching out to what customer under what accounts and what invoices they've sent them. If you need right. all that to That's be exactly like right. linked together, right? And you want to be able to follow that paper trail, like this is the system. Like that's totally. the system. It's ERPs do process management very well. I yeah. would argue Nextcloud does not do process management. It does file, basically file handling. Yeah. Uh, which, if you want to add a note saying, "Hey, go over to Nextcloud and get the file here," you can, or you can just upload it straight to the straight to Dollar Bar. Now, what? So, what can't Dollar Bar do? That is a good one. Um, my favorite. It can't make you coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's. Really, it's there are a handful of limits. Uh, Dollar Bar does not contain a payroll module. I think they said yet. Okay. It doesn't contain a payroll module yet. So I assume that's something that they're working on or that's probably an independent module you can go out and find. It could be. This uh, is and, open and source, install. right? And and this is uh, modular too. And, and I know that people do install plugins for this. So this is something that you can have a plugin ecosystem. If you have a independent third-party developer, you're like, I really need a payroll you know, payroll module. Like this is something that you could, you could fund to have developed. Totally. And this is, and it's P this is PHP. Written, written in PHP. I was just going to ask. Yep. Written in PHP. Just going to ask. Yeah. Uh, it also can't do, uh, so as I said, everything's in modules. So there's a project module, mm. uh, which can manage tasks. Uh, not to go off on a tangent here, the project module is pretty cool, and they also have incident management. Oh, really? Um, okay. Similar. I I wouldn't call it similar to Zendesk. Uh, it's very, it's a very limited uh, incident management tool that they have, or incident management module, I should say, um, for creating. You know, we're having a we're having this problem. You know, third parties can sign on and say we're having this issue with whatever. Uh, it's out there. But on the project module, essentially, tasks on the project module can't have dependencies between each other. Kind of unfortunate, as you and I have seen in Kanban and our CAN board, we link everything yeah. together, and, basically. And well, I, and that's that's one of those those gotchas, right? With any kind of software, right? That's why I like personally, I like best of breed software because I know a lot of these yeah. kind of edge cases have been addressed. Whereas like Nextcloud's deck. I, I think it's going to be the same limitation, right? I don't think those ca tasks can have dependencies, right? But 
if you're willing to just say, I just want it to be like a to-do list that I can look at, right? Then right. it, then and it's, it may be something, fine. yeah, may, maybe something for you. Yep, it can't do, uh, it doesn't include webmail. Um, so I think when it talks about this, I, I kind of go to, I, I didn't really go into a deep dive on webmail. I figured it was kind of like an inner, inner mail type of, inner, intracompany type mail Mm -hmm. is what I had thinking. It does external. You can link an SMTP server and it sends it, it can send it to external or could send it to whomever, but basically there's no uh, web mail included with it. Um, The double party accountancy is available since 6.0, but it doesn't sound like reports are available. Fine. Uh, Just another limitation. It sounds like they're working on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If they have it in there, it sounds like they're going to be working on reports. Um, and then it also sounds like there are a couple modules there that are just in the works, but not only just in the works, but I mean, they do have dollar if you wanted to. Yeah. Right. Right. And that that's their, uh, that's their module marketplace kind of store. Thing. Yeah. 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 But there's really not, we went over, I felt like I went over a lot that dollar bar can't do. It's really not a long list. Yeah. I mean, you can really manage everything from dollar bar i you and i talked about it we, when we looked at it it has point of sale available you can yeah. run it from a server you can run it from local so yeah. there's just this is pretty cool a lot of stuff that can be done from it well yeah. and and i like this last uh kind of part you bring up here is uh, who is who is this built for yeah and really primarily it's going to be for businesses right mm-hmm. if you're signing up for an individual account on our composer i I, I don't know if I would recommend this um, unless you need to manage your own sick time or you want to manage processes on your own for different vendors. I don't see this being an individual use case. So what, who's this for? It's basically for businesses. Mm-hmm. It's for companies and freelancers selling, selling services, um, companies, manufacturing, ma- companies manufacturing products, uh, shops selling products and uh, as we said point of sale systems mm. and then uh, the other feature it's basically for businesses when it comes down to it. yeah and I, I you can take these modules and you can install whatever you want you can remove whatever you want it's it's very modular is what it dollar bar really boils down that to. and and it's uh, all the modules are are working together to give you that that one kind of cohesive workflow experience. Yeah. So it, it's a great service. We, we did add it to the R compose suite. We have it available for deployment now. So if you are a business owner, small business, and you need this kind of service, I would highly recommend checking it out. Or if you even have any questions, just reaching out on the R compose.com slash command center slash contact. But that is all I have for all of our, and ERP. Well, very nice. Uh, I wanted to finish out this episode today um, with a rant that I came up with myself. So this, if this reflects poorly on anyone, it should only reflect poorly on me. Uh, but after, after uh, the workout, you know, I was just uh, in the backyard uh, huffing and puffing, you know, after my 20 odd minutes of, of, flailing around uh i i I recorded a voice memo to myself and i I listened back to it later i'm like you know what that's that's pretty good i i kind of wanted to explore this and and figure out you know at least what what your take is on this uh and and flesh it out for my own self so the the title of of this grab bag is uh, all programmers aspire to put themselves in the position of linus torvalds why is that you know what? First of all, we all know who Linus Torvalds is, and if you don't, he's the uh, creator of the Linux kernel, and, and, and still really the, uh, the well, and the, Git. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, and Git. well, I'll, I'll get there. But most <laughs> okay. notable for uh, creating yeah. and maintaining the Linux kernel, he does actually say that Git is his most proud accomplishment. But we'll, we're we're not going there um, okay. yet. We will actually. Uh, that's that's actually point number three. But point number one is, you know, to, to the fact of, you know, why do all programmers aspire to put themselves in the position of Linus Torvalds, right? Is that he's an established presence in a large project, right? Uh, and 
you know, what is what does that mean? What what are the benefits to being an established presence in a large project? First of all, we can take a look at you know what being in a large project means, right? Um, it means that you're established in the marketplace, right? You don't have this kind of uh, fear or uncertainty towards the future, right? You kind of know that this project is chugging along. It's it's the same kind of sense of comfort that a lot of people get from having a job at a company. That's why a lot of people don't do startups because it's scary, right? You're taking a huge risk and you don't know if it's going to work. Uh, so, so being in a large project, especially an open source project, means that you you know, you, you know that you're moving something in some sort of a right direction and that's not going to completely fall out under your feet overnight. All right. So you got that kind of stability. Uh, the next is you have established norms. So like any other big company, you have an established culture, you know, kind of the the lingo or, or at least there is a lingo. Like it's not something that's trying to uh, develop itself. It's not, you know, trying out different systems of communication. Uh, it's it's not figuring out how projects are prioritized, right? There's there's a kind of norm to it where you you know what's expected of you. And once again, that's a huge comfort to someone who's coming in and saying, I really don't want to take a whole lot of risk on. And a large project will give me that opportunity to step in and there are going to be guide rails for me, right? I don't have to dive in here without any kind of support system. So those those established norms uh, can actually be a huge comfort to a lot of people. Um, and then lastly, uh, a having having a large project means that you're not scrambling all the time. You're not pulling, you know, 16 hour days trying to get something off the ground, right? There is a, a understanding, you know, and we touched on this in the beginning, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of human aspect uh, in, in the picture of any kind of business or any kind of project, right? And that's, that's where projects that get this big do not get this big without understanding that. Um, and, and having a really good work-life balance. I mean, Linus himself, you know, I, I even linked here. He, he says, you know, I'm not a programmer anymore, right? He's, he's gotten to the point where he is reviewing and, uh, looking at, at, at change requests and seeing if it, if it makes sense, you know, and, and he knows code like the back of his hand. So he can tell you if something's good or bad just by kind of glancing over it, but that's Linus. He's, He's somewhere, he's something that you would aspire to put yourself in the position of. Um, so having that work-life balance is, is going to be a part of any kind of large project, right? But, but using Linus as a, as a segue here, he is also an established presence in that large project, right? So he's not some newcomer right. to a large project. He, he's been there. He, he literally created it. So since the beginning, but there's a lot of people who have been in that project for a long, long time as well. And what are the benefits to them? Right. One is, you know, the project just inside and out. Right. And there's a, there's a really good feeling when, when you know, uh, you know, something, how something should be architected just because you know, the project. So everything well. of it. You yeah. know, you know what the logic workflow is. You know how data is sp supposed to flow through it. You know, you you have a good grasp on what it is you're building, right? And and coming from that being established in the market, you know what is expected of that product, right? And and the constraints that you're operating under, right? So where something may be a good decision for a smaller uh, project, you know, for, for this kind of a bigger project, maybe you want to approach it a different type of way because of the constraints that you work under, right? So knowing that project inside and out is definitely a sense of release or, and, and it gives you a, a good foundation, right? To, to work off of, right? You're also able, and I love this one, being able to reference documented decisions, right? So like there's always going to be that young whippersnapper who comes up and says, you know, I've got a great idea. Uh, and, and it's just a terrible idea. Just, just the worst, right? Being able to point back to a previous discussion where all of the implications were already hashed out and agreed to by all the participants and a determination reached is a lot easier than having that conversation once every year or two, right? It, it, it saves a lot of time. You're able to go back and say, Hey, you know what? Look, there's definitely some, uh, advantages to what you're proposing here. However, we've gone through, made that deliberation, and and we just decided that's not for us, right? Like, thanks, 
thanks for the input. I, I definitely value it. And, and here's kind of where we, we went. Or, you know, if someone's asking you, why is this the way it is? You, you go back, you know, you reference that, 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 that decision making process, or even better yet, the documentation that you know exactly where to point people because you know the project inside out, right? Um, better yet, the comments in your code because we all comment our code, don't we? Right. Of course. Of, of course, course. Of course. Um, and then uh, the the last kind of thing, which which really only applies to people who are lifers, you know, you would call them in a project. But you know, you're a guy from you're the guy from that project, right? Linus is the guy who wrote the Linux kernel, right? Um, Greg Kh is the guy who's the protege of Linus, right? And and you know, there's there's all the other different types of people who are in these big open source projects who are big names. Right. Um, whether they're the project lead or, or just the, the face of the project, right? They can, can put a part of their identity in that project. They could say, Hey, you know what? I, I kind of am the guy from that project. Um, you know, uh, Wimpy, who led the Ubuntu pro- uh, podcast, you know, for like 15 years, right? I mean, he was an established voice in the community and, and I, I probably forevermore, he will be known as the Ubuntu guy. Right. Because totally. he has been a part of that for just so long. Um, so having having that kind of security, uh, being an established presence in a large project um, is is a great place to be. Right. And it's something a lot of open source developers are working towards. Right. And and there are very good reasons, I think, why they are they're working towards that. And you can kind of see where people are trying to do that, you know, even if they're young are upstart developers right they kind of are are developing this with a a uh, vision towards becoming an established uh, presence in the market and established presence in that large project that is in that market um, now what's even better than that you ask well being the bdfl of that project right because you know as uh, mel brooks says you know it's good to be the king you know so <laughs> For those of you who don't know, BDFL stands for Benevolent Dictator for Life. Uh, and this is the uh, name that's given to a lot of people who have uh, a, a big project, but they're the ultimate decision maker. You know, they, there's not like been a committee established. You know, they're, they're kind of uh, where the buck ends, you know, or, or where the buck stops, right? They, they, they are the one who has the final say in, in what goes on. Um, that means they're also responsible for coordinating team efforts, getting releases out, making sure that security, you know, they're, they are literally where the buck stops. And, and I like to think of it as flipping the CEO aspect on its head because it's a leader who doesn't necessarily um, set, set policy, you know, but it's, it's that leader that is down in the mud and doing the things that enables everyone else, empowers everyone else, if we're using the same words today, empowers everyone else to do the work that they need to do. Uh, and and that, that BDFL is a very respected position because they're the ones who have that vision for the project. They're the ones who have uh, the the idea set and they're the ones who are going to be down, you know, get their hands deep and doing all the stuff that, you know, isn't the shiny, oh, a contributor can just jump in and do this little thing real quick. Right. right? They're the ones who are who are doing that maintenance, that thankless maintenance day in and day out. And and they earn that title and that title is used with much respect. So. Why do you want to be a BDFL, right? Well, you get that respect, right? Uh, you get, you know, the the legacy of being the BDFL. I mean, you're you're not only uh, a guy from that project; you are literally the guy from that project. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, perks and and different opportunities, right? Uh, being the face of something, you know, gives you a lot of opportunities to. Uh, to have doors open to you that wouldn't otherwise, right? You you are the head of a community, right? You do have uh, influence and pull and, and persuasion, right? And you can use that. Uh, you can you can use that when you're talking at conferences. You can use that while you're taking a stance on what you think the ethical way uh, that something should be 
maintained or, or used or, or, you know, something should be left alone. Um, your word carries a lot of weight, right? And you can not throw your weight around, but, but you can definitely have more influence than not, uh, especially if that project is, is sufficiently large. Um, now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of competition in that space. So the minute that starts getting abused, I mean, you have to really be careful because that's that's not right. going to be in your best interest, right? You're, you're always going to be stuck with this pull between, you know, am I, am I, uh, am I at the top of this hierarchy because I'm competent or am I at the top of this hierarchy because I'm abusing my power, right? And you have to wield power intelligently right responsibly uh, responsibly too, right. yeah because if you're the large project lead i mean you're the one who has to say guys this is not cool like we shouldn't brigade this other project right we shouldn't disparage other people in the community right you need to use your you know power for good because with great power comes great responsibility i mean we we've all grown up with that one uh, and, and then at the other side, you also have to be competent, right? You can't lose your competency. You can't stop contributing. You know, it, the, the minute you stop contributing, you, you know, you become an armchair quarterback and, and no one likes that. And, and you get ousted really quick. Um, and then hopefully you can find some way to kind of turn that into, to, to monetary gain, right? You can, you can monetize that somehow and, and that's up to you, right? And and that will kind of feed back into what your legacy is and, and how you uh, are perceived to have wielded your power. A um, couple more things about uh, BDFLs to, to talk about here. Uh, I mentioned Greg KH as Linus's right-hand man. Uh, and, and Linus does have a huge support system. As he says right now, he's, he's not even a programmer. Uh, he, is, he is simply being the BDFL of the project and, and being kind of the last sign off and, and the last word on everything. He has a lot of different projects. He's been able to intelligently delegate a lot of work. And he's, I think he's done that very successfully. I mean, the ability for the Linux kernel to scale to the extent that it has is, is unprecedented. There's no other project that big. He is, he is tread you know, in, in wilderness that no other devs have even seen yet. Like he's, he's at such big scale that, you know, in, in, in so many different contributors with so many different use cases. Um, and, and I think, you know, the decisions that he's made uh, has been very it, it, difficult, I'm sure. Right. Um, but the, the ones he's been able to delegate are actually, I would argue, more important because he's created a community, right? He's used his power to create that community that fosters a good engagement process, right? And talking about decisions, right? When you're BDFL, you kind of get to set, you know, the, the, the policy, right? You get to make the decisions, right? So along with the responsibility comes, you know, one of those perks and says, you know what, guys, we're going to do it my way this time. Sorry, you know? Don't don't pull that card too often, but it's good to have that one in your back pocket when you need it. Uh, so one of his policies uh, that I hear him repeating all the time is don't break user space. Right. He's he just made that a policy. He's like, you know what, guys, um, one of the things that I have uh, determined is, you know, we are not going to break user space, period. End of story. Right. And if you try to merge something that does that. I will reject that merge. Sure. Uh, and and that decision has been one of the ones that I think has made the Linux kernel so developer friendly, right? It's it's very nice to develop against it because legacy stuff does kind of continue to live on. And Just that's another thing too. Legacy isn't always a bad word, right? Uh, so I, I was thinking about this and I was like, all right, well, how would I see this in infrastructure, right? What if I used, if I had like an old server I wanted to decom and I had everything set up on a new server, everything brand new, everything was, was correct, technically correct on this new server. Everything's updated. Everything's, you know, ready to go. But I had a lot of stuff that was pointing to that old URL that I just didn't have the time to get around and, and update. What would be the impact of like throwing a C name in DNS and just having point to the new server, right? Um, a lot of people would consider that technical debt, 
right? Uh, but I think something that you and I have talked about, if it's not causing you additional work or, or headache, right, it's not technical debt that needs to be addressed, right? It's right. not debt that you're actively paying off, right? Now, if it's compounding, maybe you want to consider it, but it's not something that's actually making your day-to-day or your long-term plans much more difficult, right? You can document that as a fix. You can say, you know what, guys, this decision has been made. This this is just going to live as it is right now. It's documented. It's known. And we're just going to move on from there. There's a lot of different shims. There's a lot of different workarounds. There's a lot of different hacks that people put into their programs. The good kind of hacks, not the bad kind of hacks. You know, then and they do this just because they're following their own decisions and policy making. And I think as a BDFL, you get to make those for better or for worse. That is your responsibility. And and that gives you a a large degree of freedom to make those those decisions, but uh, you know, it it's 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 a better place to be than having to deal with something that's that you have no say in. So being right. being a BDFL is is always going to be a better place to be in a project than than not. Um, but talking about workarounds, talking about hacky scripts, talking about, you know, putting shims in project, uh, I would say probably the hardest part about jumping into any project isn't necessarily understanding what the project is or where the market fit is or who's who, you know, what the relationships are. I'd, I'd say probably the hardest thing about jumping into a project is just figuring out how to set up a testing environment. Totally. And I've said, I, I've, I've been slowly thinking about this for like the past couple of months and I've been working on various things, kind of bringing them in and, and, and fiddling with them here and there. And I'm like, why is it so difficult for me to just jump into a new project? Right. It's because the people who've already been there already have their tools set up, already have their environment set up, know the workflow, know the they, they have all of this going on. Right. And figuring out how to just see if the change I made is working. Right. Or or can, can I just write a hello world that works somewhere? Right. Sure. How do I do that? And that is 90 percent of the startup time of any different new contributor is saying, how do I set up this testing environment? Right. And Linus, being the OG that he is, wrote his own tool set. Now, OK, everyone writes glue code. Yeah, and and not just in applications, sure. right? Not just in pipelines and development processes and tooling, but even like in ops and infrastructure, right? You're still going to have all your little shim scripts to copy this one file from over here to over there. Just, you know, just real quick because that needs to happen. And it's better than copy pasting it manually, you know, every Sunday night at 3 a.m., right? When I'd rather have this script be running. So everyone writes these little glue code that I, I say, all these all these little snippets. Uh, now, as, as a part of the maturation process of, of any kind of uh, project like that, they tend to re- start to, to gather this glue code. You know, they, they scope it out and they try to reduce it down to like a manageable tool or, or some kind of process, right? You 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 systematize it, right? You make it hopefully modular, right? Hopefully you're able to to keep it modern. Uh, and and you you make it stable as a result of of the above, right? You, you you take everything and you make it part of the process. You make your tooling part of the process so that you you have room to write your little glue code snippets within a larger framework. Right. Right. For Linus, that framework was Git. Uh, and Git was a, a tool. I don't even feel like I have to explain it, but Git is a source control. Uh, uh, um, SCM, S- SVM. Source control yeah. management. Yeah. Source control Ad- management or, 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 you know, version management software that uh, keeps track of the history of changes to code. And he took like a weekend off or a week off or a month off or something. He was like, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed, guys. I'll BRB. And then he comes back with this project that has been adopted by almost every single open source project to date, at least all the new ones. Uh, and and he just kind of released it. He's just like, eh, I'm, 
I, I got to scratch my own itch, uh, and and I'm just going to toss this out there, and um, it's a tool I'm going to be using going forward to manage the patching and updating and, and making changes to the Linux kernel. Uh, and and he comes out with this thing that was just miles ahead of anything else on the market, right? Especially for this kind of collaborative, large scale problem that he was having, you know. And and to your point, yeah, he's not developing it now. He's like, I maintain right. Git for like six months and no more. But still, he's the one who conceptualized it, you know, and 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 birthed it, as you will, and and kind of gave it up into the the broader community, right? And and. <laughs> Guys, like, are you kidding me? Not only do you do you create one of the largest projects out there, you also create one of the most popular tools just so that you can manage one of the largest projects out there, and and it becomes a success as well, right? So it 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 just it just blows my mind. It just blows my mind the amount of success that this guy has had. Uh, he, he's just had a couple of really well thought out projects, right? And and that's really all it takes, right? Uh, and and well, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, well, you said it. The one is just quite literally him scratching his own itch. Yeah. I'm sure he had people trying to work on, work on a, uh, was it Minix at the time? Was it, What was it at the time? Yeah, Minix. Was it Minix yep. at the time? Yep. Yeah. And I'm sure he had all these people trying to put stuff in, and he's thinking to himself, how is this going to work? How am I going to manage all these changes to these files? And sure enough, he just went out there, one took a weekend off, it sounds like, and f- solved his own problem easy enough. Yeah. And and so, you know, this is that's that's the last part of, you know, what developers, I think, are looking to do, right? Um, you know, to 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 kind of sum up what we talk about, I mean, they're looking to looking to achieve what I say here, long running purpose that gives them meaning and successful work life balance. Right? That's that's part of being a established player in a large project. Right? Um, you know, being being in a project that they're familiar with and which scratches their own itch, which allows them a degree of authority, is also another thing that. That people want to be, you know, we're, we're talking about autonomy, right? Making your own decisions is a core aspect of motivation, right? There is no other place to be if you want to make your own decisions than to be the BDFL, I'll tell you that. But I don't know if I want to make all those decisions. But backing off of that, uh, the, the last thing, you know, I think is, is core, you know, and this kind of really speaks to the day-to-day aspect of, you know, what are you going to do for the rest of your life, man, right? Well, I think I would rather be using the tools that I prefer and, you know, and, and, and the ones that I've crafted or, or tweaked or, or, you know, tailored to my own needs. Right. And, and Linus has successfully done that. He's successfully done all three of those things. And I think that, you know, the, the, speaking speaking about large projects, I mean, we're, we're not right now. I, I would love to be someday. Um, and, you know, I might want to write Git as well. Or maybe it's the next, you know, uh, huge DeFi application on, you know, Smart BCH or something like that. I, I don't know what's what's up next, right? What's next? Sure. You know, yeah. all I know is that, you know what, I am I'm willing to, to take a look at at all the other projects out there, right? I can also step down and say, hey, you know what, you're the BDFL of that project, or you know, you're an established member of that project. I I am so thankful uh that you've taken the time and and dedicated the time and and put in the effort to be a part of this community, to establish and maintain relationships, uh, and and to put in hard work into maintaining the the project that you maintain. And and those are the ideals of open source, right? Those are the collaborative uh, ideas that drive successful open source projects, right? And we're going to be in this journey. We would love you to be in this journey. You know, come and learn, you know, what communities are out there. If, if you're really drawn to Dollar Bar, there's tons of people out there whose job it is to talk and troubleshoot and, you know, do cool things with dollar bar maybe it's next cloud maybe it's bitward i don't don't know what it is right but if you're looking to be part of that community right and you don't know where to start uh easiest place to go go to arcompose.com 
right? Sign up for our newsletter because we're gonna be we're gonna be starting to talk about these things. I, I as we have been, right? We're we're going to be in these communities. We're gonna be in these projects. We're gonna you know take the temperature of the ecosystem and and see where it's going, and and we would love for you to be on that journey with us. But for now, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.